I came under severe attack in the interim for not addressing or not recognizing questions from the audience. So give, I, I am going to recognize questions from the audience. I should warn you, however, two things. First of all, there are microphones circulating. And the second is that with the brightness of the lights, I can't see very well. So you'll have to raise your hand high. And I think it's, is it Danielle? It's, uh, uh, does someone have a microphone over here? We do have microphones. Yeah, OK, thank you. Please what, identify yourself, Daniel. Tell you what it struck me, <laughs> and I, I'll hook up with the first panel. What I think has been missing prominently in the first panel was um, the military component, ingredient of strategizing in the global space. It may be, when it comes to international trade, trade benefits fine with this logic. But <laughs> when there is such a clear shift of power, in the global space in China. I mean, look how much we focus on China. It's like China is the economic for everybody, primarily of the United States. And it may be that there is much more than trade and economic logic. It's military, it's the balance of power. And in this is the case, it's not only Trump. There could be also the military establishment. So I think it's much more at stake. Secondly, <laughs> What's also surprising is you have not mentioned, and I, I'm, I'm talking about the first panel as well, climate change. That's more of an existential threat than, I don't know, artificial intelligence not being able to cope with uh, labor dislocation. So uh, this is also something we should pay attention to. And um, I, I, would I would have loved the first panel to address these issues. Well, you have a second panel. Is, would anybody like to address either of those issues? The power, I mean, the power shift seemed, or the notion that this is a broader shift in power seems relevant to, certainly, to the WTO and also to Japan's position. If you have anything you'd like to say about that, Carl or Ito? Okay, we are caught um, also in this um, struggle between the US and China. But of course, we have no uh, military aspects in this. But I would like to say that um, our understanding is, or my understanding is, that uh, the Chinese um, internal powers will do whatever is necessary to improve the fate of people internally. This is how they get um, the, the legitimacy for staying in power. So I think um, the military power is only an annex to um, trying to improve the lot of the Chinese people. Uh, I'm not a specialist about just the military system, but uh, I'd like to just, uh, just mention a very related issues. Uh, the, when I was talking to the American uh, politician, not Mr. Trump, more just also Trump, what he said, is the tax on export of the car, say, to the United States only 2.5%. And the tariff on the, to China is something like 20 to 25%. And when Chinese company is making investment in the United States, they can. But when American company do invest in the United States, in China, they can't have more than 50% of the share, and so on and so forth. So there seems to be very difficult confliction between the two big uh, uh, countries. Now, if you uh, look back to just the international trading system in the past, it is more or less just the system among the, the developed countries. They have a negotiation. And they are very uh, nice to other developing countries to provide just a lower tariff and so forth. But when the developing country or emerging country start challenging the order of that country and system. Then there's a conflict. We had many experience in Japan uh, for the trade restrictions and uh, enforced, uh, forced the expansion of import and so forth. So in the case of Japan, it's a process or history of adjusting our system to the Western type of the liberal. But now, because China becomes so big and uh, it is so conflicting with the traditional system, so I think it's uh, very difficult to the uh, solve the problem. And then comes just the power issue is very much related to that. Yeah, I, I can't address the climate change issue, but I think that in some sense, the rise of China 
is at the root of many of the problems, many of the issues, let's not call them problems because I don't want to blame China for the problems, but the fact that China has become such an extraordinarily important part of the international economy has had a whole range of effects both domestically and internationally and helps explain why we're seeing such disruption in both domestic and international politics, militarily and economically. So I think you're right about, to focus on that. But I want to get to the next question over here. Je vous remercie. En fait, mon, euh, ma question, alors, euh, Monsieur Leishoubi, euh, hold, hold politologue. On, to, for those who don't speak French, you'll have to put on your. Sorry, I don't speak English. That's all right. Don't speak, speak very well English. I prefer okay. speak uh, French. It's uh, That's fine. easy for That's me. Fine. Sorry. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. Patrick, you don't need it. <laughs> He's okay. going to speak in French. So for those who don't speak French. Oui, non, en fait, ma question est plus relative au premier panel, mais elle a une incidence très forte sur le, sur le second. Mon ami Thierry, dans son intervention, a un peu ouvert une piste en souhaitant un élargissement du, du, du débat, un approfondissement de la question. Alors je me demande, en écoutant les, les différents amis, les différents analystes, si nous ne sommes pas frappés d'un petit peu de timidité C'est-à-dire si dans l'analyse critique, il ne faut peut-être pas aller un peu plus loin. Et je me pose la question si cette timidité n'est pas illustrative d'une autre question un peu plus profonde. Je m'explique. Euh, nous, nous sommes en, en fait, à mon sens, la dimension géopolitique prend, prend, prend et a, a une, un poids extrêmement euh, important. Et puis, il y a des mondes qui viennent, que nous ne pouvons pas ignorer, des questions plus complexes. Je résume. Les protagonistes ne sont plus les mêmes, parce que la crainte, c'est de croire qu'on peut substituer à l'ancienne URSS la Chine pour une bipolarité, pour un tête-à-tête, -tête, et euh, le problème se réglerait, on analyserait le potentiel, la capacité des États-Unis et, et, et ceux de, de la Chine. Il me semble que la question ne se pose pas comme ça, parce que celle-ci recoupe le fait qu'il y a une sorte... C'est comme le traitement de la crise économique mondiale. On est persuadé qu'il faut des réajustements et on évite des questions qui se posent qui sont certainement plus profondes. À mon sens, il y a des mondes qui viennent et que nous ne devons pas du tout euh, ignorer. Je m'explique. Les protagonistes, la Chine est totalement insérée au commerce mondial. 380% d'augmentation entre 2000 et 2009. Elle détient 23% de, de l'endettement euh, américain. Euh, les USA eux-mêmes ne sont plus leaders d'un monde qui avait le quasi-monopole de la production technologique, de la dissuasion nucléaire, euh, du droit de, des finances. Et donc nous sommes manifestement sur un monde qui est totalement en mutation, avec évidemment la question de, de l'endettement, mais surtout une coïncidence majeure entre la crise économique mondiale, qui a des effets fondamentaux, La fin de cycle de toutes les grandes questions de, 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 de process technologique pour la, la planète, que ce soit sur les questions écologiques évoquées par mon ami ministre roumain, etc. Et donc un émiettement de la pensée politique, un affaiblissement du, du, du politique. Et là, nous sommes dans un espace totalement différent qui va impacter aussi l'instrumentation qui est l'OMC, que, que sont toutes les autres. Alors, est-ce qu'on va faire une instrumentation qui va tenter de gérer l'éventuel compromis entre deux ou trois grandes puissances, ou est-ce qu'en fait nous allons avoir affaire à un monde complètement différent nous, nous avons certains pays, certains espaces, certaines velléités, recoupées dans les BRICS ou recoupées ailleurs, qui estiment qu'elles ont en face d'elles éventuellement l'ancienne triade, que les uns ont qualifié comme de système monde hégémonique, et vous avez deux tiers quand même, de la population mondiale, etc., avec des capacités. Quatre des pays du, 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 des BRICS ont les plus gros, le, le niveau le plus élevé des PIB PPA euh, dans le monde. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, nous sommes en présence, à mon sens, d'une grande mutation qui concerne différents mondes et des mondes qui viennent. Et à mon sens, nous ne devons pas uniquement la résumer à un tête-à-tête sino-américain Auquel cas, la Chine n'est plus celle que l'on croyait et n'est certainement pas l'URSS. USA, les USA ne sont plus ceux qu'on imaginait et certainement pas les USA de l'époque. Les mondes changent et donc est-ce que le débat ne devrait pas plus aller vers son élément central Quels sont ces mondes qui viennent Comment doit-on 
s'organiser. Parce que les espaces intérieurs de ces grandes puissances eux-mêmes mutent, eux-mêmes sont concernés. Je veux dire, les élites de ces propres pays se posent des questions. Comment inventer ces nouveaux mondes Est-ce que nous aurons un débat entre ceux qui imaginent que la géopolitique de puissance va continuer à s'imposer Ou est-ce que ceux qui défendent l'école du partenariat mondial plus apaisé, avec une vision plus ouverte, vont réussir à se frayer un chemin Je vous remercie. Je ne me suis pas présenté, euh, Monsieur Laïchoubi, politologue, chercheur, membre de l'Académie royale d'Espagne et ancien ministre algérien. Je vous remercie. Ok. Well, um, who would like to address that? Patrick, do you have something? That you seem to. I think this raises, I should say, this raises a series of questions that Kemal Derish did, did raise in the first panel. And to some extent, it seems to me that these are questions that will recur throughout our proceedings because it has to do with what kind of world we are entering into and what kind of set of world problems we are likely to face and how to think about them. So I thank you for the intervention. It does go somewhat beyond the, the, the breadth or depth of what we're talking about, but uh, it is relevant to some of the issues that have been raised. Patrick. Je vais, je vais, je vais me permettre de répondre en français. Um, je, je pense qu'effectivement la, 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 la période est extrêmement, extrêmement intéressante et qu'on en est à la conjonction d'événements euh, majeurs euh, qui, euh, qui, qui accélèrent les uns les autres. Vous n'avez pas mentionné l'Inde euh, qui est également euh, d'une grande force et une grande complexité et qui va jouer un rôle majeur à venir. Je pense que la manière dont les états unis actuellement déconstruisent les relations internationales, on l'a vu en particulier avec le JCPOE, on l'a vu quand ils sortent des, des accords de Paris euh, sur euh, la COP21, et on voit du coup qu'on bascule à nouveau dans une incertitude euh, des conventions internationales. Cette incertitude, elle impacte toutes les relations, y compris les relations d'affaires, y compris euh, notamment euh, les, les questions de défense, et je pense en particulier euh, à l'Asie-Pacifique, où on voit une redistribution des cartes euh, qui n'est pas du tout celle qu'on anticipait quelques années auparavant. On voit des alliances se, se nouer qui n'existaient pas auparavant. On le voit au niveau de l'Asie-Pacifique, ça se trouve aussi au niveau de l'Europe, euh, L'Angleterre, c'est le premier budget de défense en Europe. Aujourd'hui, ils sont en train de regarder et de poser des alliances avec des pays hors Europe, en Asie et ailleurs, justement pour continuer à avoir des projets de défense et avoir une autonomie et une souveraineté. Les États travaillent entre eux. On le voit en Amérique du Sud et on le voit en Asie-Pacifique beaucoup, où auparavant, euh, ils faisaient partie d'une communauté, je parle d'États entre guillemets, qui ne sont pas des grandes puissances. Euh, il y avait une communauté d'États de puissance moyenne qui négociait avec des grands. Et on voit que tout d'un coup, ils se mettent euh, sur quelque chose qui est totalement asymétrique, qui est d'avoir une relation et une discussion avec un État euh, beaucoup, beaucoup plus puissant. Et en fait, ça entraîne derrière des crispations et, et des résistances. Et c'est un mouvement qui renforce en fait le protectionnisme, euh, parce qu'ils se retrouvent encore plus exposés qu'ils ne l'étaient auparavant. Donc je crois que ça, ce sont des phénomènes qui changent en profondeur. Et le phénomène un peu contraire, on en a parlé un peu ce matin, je pense, c'est la révolution euh, di digitale, pour faire court, euh, qui est quelque chose qui est quand même un accélérateur pour beaucoup de ces pays. On voit que beaucoup de pays vont, euh, là pour le coup c'est l'anglais, vont leapfrogger, vont aller à l'étape suivante. Ça se trouve en Afrique. Euh, on a, nous avions tout à l'heure euh, l'honneur d'avoir le Premier ministre de la Côte d'Ivoire. Mais d'autres pays d'Afrique également sont sur cette démarche très volontaire d'essayer d'aller tout de suite à l'étape suivante pour essayer justement de ne pas se retrouver euh, tenu dans une place de petit pays, petite puissance, servant les grandes. Et donc je pense que les deux, les deux phénomènes aujourd'hui euh, se, se conjuguent et, euh, et je pense que ça amène effectivement une très très grande instabilité et, euh, et on voit aujourd'hui un peu le camp de ceux qui souhaitent effectivement un monde multipolaire qui se parle et ceux qui regardent leur marché intérieur et se disent comment je peux le protéger et les conséquences en dehors de ce marché intérieur ne m'intéressent peu ou pas. Carl, I think the issue raised here in some sense is rele highly relevant to the WTO because on the one hand we have concerns from the, from the United States about the role of the WTO, but there have also been concerns such as those expressed by Kamal Divrish about the role of the WTO in encouraging, perhaps, well, perhaps more effectively encouraging development in the, in the poorer parts of the world. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Um, the intervention started with um, the sentiment that nous sommes trop timides. Um, and I don't know when you say nous sommes trop timides, who is nous? <laughs> um, 
coming from the WTO as a member-driven organization. The Secretariat, unfortunately, has no rights to initiatives, but um, the setup of the um, WTO was such, still is such, that one country has one vote. So um, this was actually the ideal world where the weak, the timid, would have a say. When you say we, me coming from the European Union, I always think of the European Union, and here I in fact think we are trop timide. Um, also this morning in the first panel, there was talk of the big powers, uh, US, China. In fact, Europe is the bigger industrial power. And Europe, I'm very happy to be a European because the Europeans always come up with very well-balanced uh, proposals, good analysis, and uh, trying to invest in, still trying to invest in the global common good. Um, so I would be hoping that um, they would be less timid and take a stronger leadership role. Mm -hmm. That would be my wish. I can point out, since you are too modest to do so, that in some ways, in a, perhaps a small way, the dispute settlement system is an extraordinary tool in the hands of the weak. Countries like Costa Rica have prevailed over countries like the United States in the dispute settlement system. And when that system was working, which it did for, has, really since its inception, the U.S. was obeying rulings against it on the part of Costa Rica. So, so I think that I mean, it, it doesn't address the broader issues, but I do think that, in my humble opinion, a system based on the rule of law tends to work in the interests of the weak, not the strong. Please identify yourself, and is there a microphone here up front? Uh, thank you very much. I'm following up of uh, the discussion. As my question is to Mr. Browner, uh, the WTO issue. I agree that the dispute settlement mechanism is jewel in the crown of uh, WTO. I am also concerned about the body itself, not only the crown, that okay. is the decision-making process. And as you rightly said, it's member-driven and it is not Secretary Art's role to uh, change the system. But in this world, to make a consensus of 150 more than 150 countries is almost impossible. And last 15 years, we were trying to get out of that by making smaller informal groups which led us nowhere. And now uh, we are going to plurilateral groups and things like that, which is also parting from most favored nation Article 1 spirit of WTO. How should we go about uh, with this situation? Should, should we make a more formalization of green type council, like United Nations, where they can decide things or ma introduce majority system? If we just go with this decision making, that would lead us nowhere is the lot of people thinking and I know that it's a member driven organization as you rightly said but I just wanted to if you can share your views as well thank you very much go right ahead Carl it, it's uh, very difficult to um, foresee what the outcome of the current reform process is because uh, there is still this uh, struggle in the membership about uh, how do we handle the Doha development agenda? And there are some other members uh, like those who in Buenos Aires in December last year at the 11th Ministerial Conference decided to move forward with certain topics. So we have now um, four um, very intensively working groups of varying member states on e-commerce, on uh, investment facilitation, on uh, micro and small and uh, medium-sized enterprises and on services regulation. So um, you mentioned that in the past we had plurilateral agreements, but they were MFN. Like when we concluded, I think among 63 member states, the extension of the list of 
uh, IT products that would be um, uh, dealed, um, traded, um, custom free. This was made um, MFN. This follows the um, most favorite nation principle and all those who are not part of it um, are, the others would say, free riders. Um, how we are going to develop the negotiation arm of the WTO in smaller groups with um, agreements among only a few, um, invitation for everybody to participate, um, or whether we um, try to maintain a consensus among 164 remains to be seen. Okay. Well, I want to point out, first of all, that this is only the first session. Ah, do we have another question? Okay, last question in the middle here. I promised Thierry to get us back on track. So okay, we'll finish you. more or less on time. Okay, this is a short question, and um, I, as I consider we are still in the liminary session, um, I would say that I... Uh, I didn't miss it, but I, I noticed that you didn't mention among the global uh, contemporary problems today, the migrations, uh, which have, happens to be an obsession in Europe, uh, for instance. Do, does it mean that uh, that type of obsession is not justified? How do you evaluate, thank you, as a global problem? <laughs> Um, would anybody like to address the issue of migration? It is related to illegal trade. I will point out, in the interest of, of, of promotion, I suppose, that we do have a panel coming up at 3 o'clock this afternoon on migration and the future of multiculturalism. But it is true that we have not addressed it in the two panels this morning. Would someone like to say something about it? <laughs> well, I, I, I will Go ahead. It is an obsession with everyone, I believe. Um, and, and I was only going to point out that there are sessions about this uh, uh, directly. So I really, uh, but you, you are not alone in your obsession. I, I think it is it's concerning uh, of, of everyone. And I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I'm waiting to hear. I think that, that it, it does fit into this broader characterization of the populist upsurge that we've seen, where, which varies from country to country, where there's concern on the part of many that the ability of national governments to pursue policies that may be in line with the desires of their citizens have been lost either due to globalization or to European integration or to some other uh, factor. I don't happen to share those concerns, but we know now that uh, even in countries that have virtually no immigrants, immigration has become a hot button issue. So I'm, I'm, I too am looking forward to the session later on today, and I'm sure that it will come up over and over again during our proceedings.